Hello everyone and welcome to part 3 of the basic module in network security. In this module we'll be looking at botnet detection methods. And I will start by saying that this is a, a challenging part. It's challenging because it's difficult to trace back to the, um, the command and control service and therefore it's been more difficult to find the people who are actually behind the botnets. And we know that they are often hiding several layers behind the zombies that are actually carrying out the malicious activities so from the zombies, several layers of proctors up to the command and control servers and as we saw before they can be it's, it can be a, a quickly moving target that we're looking for and also the botnets are of course uh, quite robust um, with command and control servers in different countries and we know they are designed so they are difficult to find but nevertheless, in this presentation, we'll look at diff different methods to detect a botnet activity. We'll be mainly looking at network-based methods, where we're looking for activities that are taking place in the network, but I will also mention a couple of other ways to do it. And then I will start by stating that, in my opinion, uh, if you really want to do good detection, you need to combine different approaches. Of course, keep in mind that the programmers behind this are often really is highly skilled, criminals who are who are good in what they're doing, who has access to many resources and who are putting a lot of effort into not being detected, detected. Also we want or we need to have high detection accuracy so if we can say uh, that 10% of the traffic, ah this might be botnet traffic but that there are only very few of them which are actually botnet traffic, it's not so interesting because uh, it will be impossible to go through uh, too much benign traffic in order to find uh, the malicious traffic. So an overview of detection approaches. Well, first of all we can talk about the non-network based detection just to make sure that I get to mention it. Often we see uh, antivirus programs um, and programs that do software inspection etc. So that is things which are actually working on the host machine that could potentially be infected. These are in general efficient and I would say they're good and they're recommended so I can say many good things about the host based detection approaches um, but there are also some weaknesses. First of all they have a lack of ability to do what we can call zero day detection that is they are mainly looking for things that they already know for viruses, trojans, uh, bots that they already know exist so they can be looking for them so when there is a new bot or there is a new virus it might take a while before the, the program is updated to identify it. So in the first, in the zero day of the new malware, it might div be difficult to, um, to detect. Then users can be manipulated uh, through social engineering, uh, so they bypass the programs. And also they need to be installed on all the network's devices uh, to work efficiently. So it's not enough that you have one device in your system that can um, detect or recognize botnet traffic, you need to have it on your phone, on the iPad, on the computer, etc. So it has to be an, on each and every device, which is also a drawback, though not impossible. Then, so, so that's the network based or the host based approaches. Then we have anomaly based detection, which is taking place in the network, and that is, for example, when you have a DDoS attack uh, going on, you can see that there is now a large increase in the amount of traffic and that is an anomaly that you can detect. So usually you will be looking for, um, for for changes in the network behavior. For example, that you will see that the network latency is growing very much, that you have higher volumes of traffic than usual, maybe from specific computers, or that you will have traffic on uh, unusual ports, also often related to, to one or more computers in the network. Um, the drawback of this is that it's likely to be more visible when you actually have an attack going on, uh, so not during the command and control phase, um, and then that is uh, we would like to, to, of course, detect it a little bit before the attack and the malicious activities are taking place. Um, then there is signature-based detection, which is also part of the network-based detection which we can find by looking into the content of data packets. So we have a stream of data, we we'll go into, a, a, for example, the first packet in the flow, and then we study what is, what is inside the packet, and we look for, for signatures, or we look for patterns, which we, uh, 
we know might be belonging to a specific botnet or a specific malware. Um, however, this can be tricky if, because if people want to hide, they can for example make that a part of the content is randomly generated, so the first um, bits in the payload can be randomly generated, so you don't uh, look for a, a specific, uh, this packet is a botnet, but you don't, you have, to, you, yeah, it's arbitrary, so you don't know what you look for. Or if the content is encrypted, it's of course also hard to find. Um, so uh, another approach that I will go a bit more into depth with is to try to distinguish the botnet traffic from Benin traffic by using machine learning algorithms. And uh, this we are doing with a focus on command and control traffic, so that's quite early and before the malicious activities are actually taking place. It can be applied in different places in, in the networks. Uh, the most important is that all relevant data is processed and it's based on looking at statistical information about the network traffic so that could be what is the average packet length, what is the length of a flow, what's the number of incoming packets, what's the number of outgoing packets. So this kind of statistical information we are monitoring for every flow and then we are trying to see can we find a way uh, to characterize botnet traffic and see how it differs from uh, Binion traffic. Uh, of course, there is a weakness of this approach that if you're looking for a difference between Benin traffic and butter traffic, you can only uh, see the difference if there is actually a difference. So this is just an example of where to monitor and basically we can do it anywhere in the network. The most important is that we find a point in the, in the network where all the traffic is passing through and therefore we can, we can monitor it, we can uh, classify it and we can see if there is anything um, suspicious going on. One important concept in order to say, when I say, yeah, we want to characterize traffic and we want to describe traffic, then it's important to understand what a flow is. And uh, when we look in a, in a network, then we can say that if packs are sent between the same pair of machines, where a machine is known to have an, uh, a particular IP address, and if we use the same port and the same um, protocol, within the same session, we say that they belong to a flow. So that is, for example, if you visit a web page and you, uh, you receive a number of packets, uh, maybe even through a number of, um, uh, of steps, uh, but they can be said to belong to the same flow as long as they fulfill the conditions listed here. So even though there are more packets, we're saying, yeah, but they are part of the same flow. Um, so how do we, when we have a flow, how do we describe network and traffic patterns? Okay, let's look at, let's look at what actually happens if you're, for example, a web browsing. Then in the first line, what we can call the application level, we will say you are, you are web browsing for a while, you're taking a break, and then you're web browsing again. So the application behavior would be that you are using your application, you have a break, and you use your application again. Underneath that level, so within each, we can say, session of web browsing, we have a, a dialogue level. And at the dialogue level, uh, you're watching one web page, you're watching the news, you're reading, and while you're reading, you're basically not interacting. Um, so this is what we call user things. Then you're opening another web page, you're reading it, have the think time between opening the next page and so on. So even within each web page, there will still be a number of objects. So first of all, you're downloading uh, the whole web page. Then you have an image, another image, a video, whatever, which is different components. So, so when, when we say that, okay, the, um, the web browsing is the activity, it's the it's application, you have to, to, um, to dig a little bit down in order to say, okay, how do we get from the from the application down to characterizing the packets in the different flows? So uh, this is the first step. Uh, second step, we can say, okay, we have uh, some kind of uh, network, or to be a little bit more specific, um, we have a connectivity level. So when you connect to a network, you have, okay, now I'm connected to the network that lasts up a, some time, and then you disconnect. Within each connection, you will be running maybe a number of applications, 
Uh, sometimes you have more than one application at a time. So you have application one, while you're using application one, you start up another application. While you're using that, you start a third application and so on. Then within each application, which could be your web browser, there will be a dialog level. So in the example here, you see that the, the request you're sending is quite small and then you are receiving a large amount of data. So that could be the request for a website and then you receive a large amount of data back. And all in all, we call it this a session. And even within a session, we will have different data bursts. So, um, so first we'll have a number of packets, then maybe an acknowledgement, more packets, and so on. And eventually, we can see that, okay, now we have a pattern. Within each burst will be a number of data packets. Um, and in that way, we are down to characterizing the data packets in some way. So then we can, for example, look at, okay, what is the average, average length of a packet? Or um, how many packets do we have in a flow? Or what is the interval time between packets? So now we're down to something where we can make statistics within a flow about um, the packets in the flow. So the point of these two previous slides was say, okay, we have an application running, but getting from the application down to characterizing uh, the behavior of the packets, which we can do at a flow level, uh, is important. So some examples of features and how to describe network traffic is that we can look at the number of ingoing packets in the flow, number of outgoing packets in the flow, average packet length in the flow, the length of the first packet in the flow, the total number of bytes per flow, the protocol used, the rate of incoming versus outgoing packets, and much more. So there are many, many, and, and I could make a much longer list than this one, but this, uh, these are example of features which we can use to describe um, the network traffic, which we can use to describe the flows or even a collection of flows. And, and this is the key behind the next step where we are starting to do the machine learning stuff. So in order to do the machine learning, okay, I have another example, namely, um, should you bike or should you drive uh, to work or to school? So how to make this decision? Basically what we're doing is that we're building up a decision tree, that's the tree you're seeing to the right, and we are basing that tree on a number of observations, which is what you're seeing to the left. So based on, on what we are learning, we are able to make decisions in the future. Um, so we can say what we have on the left side is the training data. What we have on the right side is the decision tree that comes from our training data. Um, however, before starting looking at it at all, we have to be able to say, okay, in order to, uh, in this case, uh, to describe the situation, to describe the situation where you are in the morning, have to make the decision if you are driving or biking. Um, what are the attributes and then what are the possible values? This is a little bit like we had in the network case, where the attributes are what is the average packet length, what is the average number of packets in the flow, and so on. So in this case, we choose to look at weather, the distance to cover, the running late, uh, and if the fuel tank is empty of fuel. Then we have the observations, which are in the table. Uh, and based on these observations, we are able to build the tree. So you will see that if you look at the tree, it fits with all the observations we had in the table. And now the tree can be used for making decisions. So this is like what we are doing with the botnet traffic, is that we are having a table with correctly classified traffic. So we can see what is good traffic and what is, uh, or what is malicious traffic and what is beneath traffic. And then we can build up a decision tree, so based on the different features we observe, we can see is this good traffic or is it bad traffic. This is just a, a simplified example, In this is a much larger topic, but I will not go so much into that. So how we apply machine learning here is, first to train algorithms by using a set of training data, then we test the algorithm by using another data set, this is what we call test data, they should of course be different because if I have my training data and I run them on the algorithm again, yes, I should get something which corresponds to my classification because I trained according to it. So the interesting is if I show the, the algorithm some new data, 
that it has not seen before, will it be able to do the correct classification. So both the, the training data and the test data has to be correctly classified. Um, I will also say that it's, it's really challenging to find good data sets for training and testing when it, when it comes to malware traffic, because we need to have um, a, a collection of traffic, we need to have a collection of flows, which is large, because it has to be representative, but which is also correctly classified, so we know exactly what comes from from malware or botnets and what is beneath traffic. And this is something that we will go more into depth with in the last part of the lecture. So that was all for now. That was the end of the third um, basic part. So please finish this by taking the questions available in Moodle. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again very soon. Bye.